Welcome to everybody today for this uh, panel discussion. I think today we're looking at one of the most important aspects of care, what has actually happened during the pandemic. And we have an excellent panel here today. To save time, I'm going to actually ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. They will give their presentations and we will go from one presentation to the next. And then we're going to have an extended opportunity for a panel discussion and also to pick up uh, questions posed by you on the chat function and some questions which have been sent in, adv in advance. So without more ado, let me perhaps turn to our first panelist today. Can I ask you to introduce yourself and we'll start our panel presentations. Thank you. Hey, Aura. My name is Renita Russell and I am the Principal Advisor Services and Standards with Alzheimer's New Zealand. Um, Co-presenting with me today is Kathy Perry and Kathy is the Director of the Dementia Learning Centre. Today Kathy and I will share with you how our Alzheimer's organisations across New Zealand adapted their services, collaborated with other agencies and advocated both locally and nationally for those living with dementia. And at the same time, we as a country, as organisations and as individuals united to support the government and respond in our uniquely New Zealand way with araha, love and kindness, manakatanga. We will discuss the ways in which the team of 5 million adopted measures such as bubbles that changed our social behaviour and support networks, particularly during level four lockdown and three. So as can be seen here on our timeline, we moved quickly into lockdown and allowed little time for preparation from our first case on the 28th of February to our highest level alert on the 25th of March. Measures worked extremely well um, and by the 8th of June, we were back at alert level one, which is where we are now, except for a short period in August. And so it's pretty much business as usual for us, except that our business, um, our borders remain closed. We have not come this far unscathed, but the experience for us has to date been much less damaging than in many other international communities, and we recognise that. So on the 3rd of November, our national situation looked like this. And we know that we're really fortunate to have had only 25 deaths and an overall total of only 1,612 confirmed cases in New Zealand up until that date. So this slide outlines our alert level four restrictions, which I won't go into, but the initial announcement of the COVID restrictions left us all in a state of shock and uncertainty about just how we would continue to provide our services. But our team of 5 million pulled together as one for the greater good. And as a country, we all settled into our own bubbles. At a national level, um, as an organisation, our first priority was to support regional organisations by preparing guidelines for what services could be provided at the various alert levels and how they could be provided when in-person visits and groups were no longer possible. So we still organise these guidelines around our core services, which are awareness and risk reduction, walking alongside, transition and crisis management. We also quickly updated our Alzheimer's New Zealand website to include information for people living with dementia, for carers and for family and friends to ensure that there were resources available to inform them about COVID and how to manage with links to other organisations that could provide them with support and also links to things like in-home activities with, for when respite programmes were no longer available. We urge people living with dementia to develop comprehensive individual emergency plans so that their health and wellbeing could be maintained even if they were separated from their carer. Our organisations were not well prepared with IT support. Many staff did not have work cell phones. There were few laptops available. Many documents such as support plans were paper-based and they could not be accessed remotely. Many of our organisations took the opportunity though to use government emergency grants to purchase cell phones, laptops, and in some instances, devices that could be used by clients. We developed training guidelines for using Zoom for both staff and client use. And we set up systems for connecting with clients on a one to three day basis, depending on need, 
by phone, text or email. And we were actually really pleasantly surprised by the number of clients who did have access to the internet. Receiving constant advice from the Ministry of Health and our local hospital boards was a problem initially, but we did establish a weekly update to the Ministry of Health about issues that were affecting our organisations and people living with dementia in our communities. And this enabled us to have input into some national health guidelines, although we were able to have very little impact on what was happening in age residential care and in the provision of respite. Our efforts ensured that most people living with dementia continue to receive support during all alert levels. And I'll hand over to Cathy. Thank you. Um, um, kia ora, everybody. Um, in this segment, I plan to briefly present you with some of the um, results from a caregiver survey that we did um, earlier this year alongside a therapy that we moved onto a Zoom platform early in the COVID lockdown. The survey report, um, which was conducted in, um, in May, um, um, in over a week, um, we actually managed to get a very good sample of over 676 carers. And this survey actually we um, borrowed um, from uh, the UK and their survey is called the Behind Closed Doors COVID-19 Survey. I'm sure some of you will be aware of that, which was conducted in a month earlier than ours. Uh, even though we had um, different experiences in, across UK and New Zealand, the burden was certainly the results will show that they were similar. And the invisible nature and difficulty of unpaid work was made visible over this very difficult period. Um, and we will just next slide, please. This shows um, the spread of the survey participants and we had a lovely spread. So the North Island actually um, has a majority of our population and the three spy graphs on this side of the blue, orange and grey. And we had a lovely spread in the South Island of 33%. So that was a good spread across New Zealand and gave us a good indication of what carer um, problems and issues were during the COVID. Next slide, please. No surprises, um, of course. Um, just like in internationally, 90% of our survey participants were female and with only 8% male and 2% didn't state their age. Over 44%, just over under 50%, were over the age of 65, and 9% of those were over 85. Uh, the length of caregiving was um, quite an interesting, and we had a, over 35% of the sample were care caregivers for more than 15 years. We were not to actually able to extrapolate in this um, survey who were actually caring for people with a uh, diagnosis of dementia. Um, next slide, please. So what did the key messages from the carers provided us with? Well, 64% of carers um, needed to provide more care during lockdown. 51% stated this was because the services were reduced or closed. So there was a sudden halt, um, as it probably was internationally, in respite care, household support services, support worker visits, and other help except for very uh, essential community sports. Carers had to step up and fill the gaps that this workforce shortage was um, and services were stopped almost overnight. It was a steep learning curve, as you can see from these results, um, for all of those that were involved with care, caring activities. And one of the significant here was um, in this um, table is the 66% who were concerned about not being able to continue the caring role. And they articulated that in their narratives as if they were worried about if they were going to actually get COVID themselves. And of course, a, a, lot, a big majority were worried about actually experiencing burnout. For a number of these caregivers, they were then given the task of looking after their person with dementia or other disabilities uh, with, um, with um, their own health problems and their concerns about burning out. Next slide, please. 
So these were these are just the slides again, and I was interested to add in a little a couple of points down the bottom here, where some were very worried about their financial situation, um, and this was particularly for the younger onset people with dementia and their care partners, and also I was very surprised at this experience in depression anxiety from the results of COVID um, the COVID nineteen situation, and again as I mentioned earlier, they were concerned about their own safety when caring for someone. Uh, next slide, please. And I bring this slide up um, because, and this information because it was quite interesting when I move into my next section of my presentation is that most of the um, care, part, care partners and um, had devices um, and not just one device. Um, the majority had smartphones, they had internet access and they had a desktop computers that worked with internet access um, being very accessible. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna discuss briefly about um, putting um, cognitive stimulation therapy, which is a non-pharmacological um, intervention, which was developed in the UK and the UCL um, to improve, and it's been shown to improve mood, quality of life and cognition for people with mild to moderate dementia. It's usually delivered in a group setting with a maximum of seven to eight in a group. Sessions are twice a week and are conducted over a seven week period. Um, and you can go on and have maintenance, which is once a week for 24 weeks. And in the, because um, you see it's been successfully been conducted in both community and residential care settings. Um, next slide, please. We were approached, um, myself and Dr. Gary Chung are the international CST uh, trainers and master trainers here in New Zealand. And we have been providing um, training facilitators for a number of years now. Uh, and so we had good connections with um, our CST facilitators around New Zealand. We were approached by um, all these organisations down below, participating organisations, Dementia Auckland, some of these are private, some of these are um, aged care facilities, who are wanting to continue conducting their cognitive simulation therapy programmes, but wondering if it was possible to be de um, delivered in a virtual format. Uh, next slide, please. So we developed a community of practice. And in the community of practice, we were able to test um, all sorts of... Um, uh, uh, issues like the technical and getting online, um, how important the role of the co-facilitator was, um, what benefits that the um, uh, participants were receiving, um, whether they were going to be the same or not as um, our group um, activity, and um, how we could adapt sessions and content. And this continued over a period of um, five to six weeks while we continue to be in lockdown. Unfortunately, since we've come out of lockdown, the VCST um, community of practice has actually gone back to being delivered in a group setting. Uh, next slide, please. I'll hand back to Loretta, who will um, um, give our concluding comments. So currently in level one, we are able to provide in-person services with providing day respite support groups, education, awareness raising um, activities. And for most of our organisations, we're really back to um, what we were providing pre-alert levels. But we need to remain flexible and agile. We see the potential for the learnings from our experiences to be used to address some other issues that we face that are not really related to the COVID-19 situation. So we see lots of potential to use our learnings to extend our reach to more people living with dementia, as current estimates are that we're only reaching about 20 to 30% of them. The reach can be extended by accessing people in more isolated locations by using IT. Virtual contacts can also mean that um, we spend less time traveling, so allowing staff resources to be used to access more people living with dementia. Many um, clients prefer virtual visits because they don't have to travel to the appointment. They can still be with the person they are supporting and they don't have to find car parks. IT use can also support easier connecting within our commuter communities, especially between health and community agencies. And we see potential in how our new IT skills can be used for building our own capability 
For example, a staff education program provided in one organisation could be attended virtually by staff in another organisation without the need for travel, or for a support group to have people attending from across the country. The options have yet to be fully explored. But the challenge really is for us to learn from the experience so that we're prepared for future events that test our ability to provide services and at the same time strengthening support for care partners to ensure that they receive good information and respite to continue in their work despite what is happening. Um, and that's our story. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, Anita and Kathy, can I thank you both very much indeed for sharing your experience. I think we've all been very impressed across the world as to how New Zealand as a country has responded to the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think in particular, you've shared with us great experiences for of how you have looked after people in New Zealand. And I think also, in, in particular, the learnings which you've brought out from mm. this um, I think that a lot of things which we'll pick up there in the wider panel discussion, I'm sure, but particularly for me, I was concerned, I think we all are, about the references to burnout and mm. as people then move mm. forward, how you will sustain people. Hopefully now you've gone back to a phase one lockdown and you won't face a second wave as we're facing in many parts of Europe and in the Americas. But I think you've got a lot to teach us. So I think we'll store <laughs> those questions for the next session, if we may. Thank you. So with that, I think we'll now move on to our next presentation. If I could ask that to take forward. I've actually been rather remiss. I should also introduce myself. I'm David Jeffries, the Global Senior Vice President in ASI, and also have the honor of chairing the uh, FPA, the European AD platform. So it's strictly a pleasure to be invited to uh, host and chair the session today. So with that, can I move on to our next presentation from Emiliano, if you'd like to give that to us? Thank you. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Martina Lattanzi. I come from Italy, in particular in Milan. I'm a psychologist and in particular I am a doctor in cognitive psychology and health communication. And this work is part of my master thesis. This, um, this master is based on in Milan, in Italy, and in Lugano, in Switzerland. And in fact, our investigation regarding these two countries. Uh, we can say that there are more than 47 million of people with dementia worldwide and that the case is set to almost triple by, by 2050. Here I reported also some data about the context where the research took place. In particular, there are 1 million of dementia patients that live in Italy and in Switzerland there are about 151,000 of people with dementia. The data in the literature shows that 80% of people affected by dementia are cared for at home by family members and that the burden of care is almost entirely borne by the family unit itself. The COVID-19 pandemic has a disproportional high impact on vulnerable groups, such as dementia patients and caregivers. Further, COVID-19 has caused so sudden closures of social care and support services key to support carers. In particular, in Italy, SARS-CoV-2 outbreak was catastrophic with more than 800,000 confirmed cases. And in Switzerland, the pandemic presents more than 200,000 confirmed cases. Worldwide, there have been more than 50 million cases or, of SARS-CoV-2 and about 6,500 cases for every million people on average. Instead, we can see here that Italy and Switzerland are two of the countries most affected by the pandemic, with more than 15 and more than 24,000 cases per million inhabitants, respectively. In this context, our research starts. After obtaining the Neil Hobstadt from both the ethics committee of Italian and, Swiss and Switzerland, um, we distributed a cross-sectional survey via social network pages of caregivers and daycare centers. The questionnaire consisted of five parts. The first in which we asked the participants for informed consent. Then we insert social demographic questions. 
Then we decided to insert the entire Zarit burden interview being one of the most reliable tools to measure the burden of dementia caregivers due to its high internal consistency and good test retest reliability. Then we decided to insert the DAS scale to measure variables such as depression, anxiety, and stress. We decided to insert the version of uh, 21 uh, items. And finally, uh, we decided to insert also the short version of the UCLA loneliness scale to measure the construct of loneliness. The sample of respondents is made up of more than 600 subjects, of which 571 complete the questionnaire, with a mean age of 53 years old. The majority of the sample is made up of women, as we expected. We distributed the survey in the entire Italy and in, uh, only in the Swiss canton of Ticino for linguistic reason, and uh, 425 Italian subjects and 146 Ticino subjects response to our questionnaire, and this reflects the distribution of the population in the two countries. Uh, the majority of our caregiver sample takes care of one family member affected by Alzheimer's disease, and this reflects the distribution of type of dementia worldwide. Here I report other characteristics of the sample, such as the level of education and employment, and we can see that our sample is quite well distributed about the, the level of education and also about the employment. In fact, about half of our sample, our sample has an employment and uh, most of them have a full-time job. Regarding the relationship between the caregiver and his family member, we note that the majority of our sample takes care of one or both parents. Coming to the results, here we can see the distribution of the sample in the Zarit class, and we observe that the majority of our sample declare severe burden, unfortunately, unfortunately we can say, and only 3% of them have little burden or the absence of it. We collect this data during May and June of the current year, months characterized by the pandemic situation. Obviously, this is not a longitudinal study because we have no data collected uh, about in, um, in the same territory, but we can compare this data with previous one present in the literature that are collected in the Italian context. And we can observe a significant difference between the Zari score from the pre-COVID situation to the current one with a significant increase in the level of burden. For a more detailed analysis, we also carry out an investigation on the influence of such demographic variables on burden levels. And we realize, for example, that there is a higher burden in Switzerland than in Italy. Also, we can observe that the level of education have an influence on the level of on the level of burden. In fact, decreasing burden we, we observe decreasing burden with the increasing of a level of education. And finally, we observe greater burden in spouses than children, and um, which does not depend solely on increasing of age. The results of the DAS21 scale presents a little different situation with regard to constructs such as depression, anxiety, and stress. In fact, respectively, we can observe a moderate level of depression and mild level of anxiety and stress. This data during May and June of the current year months characterized by the pandemic situation. Obviously, this is not a longitudinal study, but we can compare this data with previous one present in the literature, and we can observe a significant difference between the Zarit score from the pre-COVID situation in the same Italian context to the current one, with a significant increase in the level of burden. Mm -hmm. For a more detailed analysis, we also carry out an, an investigation on the influence of sociodemographic variables on burden levels. And we realize, for example, that there is a higher burden in Switzerland than in Italy. And also that with an increase in the level of education, there is a decrease in burden. And finally, also that the group of spouses caregiver have a greater burden than the children group, which is, uh, does not depend solely, solely on increasing of age. 
The results of the DAS21 scale present a little, a little different situation with regard to constructs such as depression, anxiety, and stress. In fact, respectively, we can observe a moderate level of depression and mild levels of anxiety and stress. Finally, the results of the Hukla loneliness scale show that 60% of our sample has often perceived the feeling of loneliness in the last months, characterized by the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Comparing our data with data previously collected in the same context in a study by Evans and colleagues, we have an increase of the feeling of loneliness. In fact, most caregivers, caregivers reported discomfort related to the intensified social isolation and effort to maintain social distancing. And here we can observe the difference in means. So to conclude, the COVID-19 pandemic aggravated the condition of social isolation and burden of informal dementia caregivers, and the lockdown condition resulted in social support services being closed down on or severely restricted. So the community health services should adapt to the needs of informal caregivers and people with dementia. And online trainings and psychosocial intervention for informal caregivers should be made available promptly to respond to the needs of informal caregivers. And that's it. Thank you for the attention and for the opportunity. At the end, I would like to thank you, my supervisor and my, my, my co-supervisor, since, since uh, this is part of my master thesis work. And also, I would like to thank all the association and the daily centers that have helped us in the distribution and of uh, the questionnaire. And finally, last but not least, I would like to thank all the sweet caregivers that the, um, their contribution is essential and fundamental. And so thank you for sharing uh, their experience. So Martina, thank you very much indeed for that presentation and for your co-workers. Uh, again, I think we all saw how this, I'll use the word advisedly, tragedy unfolded in the first wave of the pandemic in Italy. I think what you've captured there is a lot of really important information. And I'm particularly impressed, I think, from the figures here, you've got 571 responders out of a sample of 664. That's tremendous. So I think with all that information, there are a lot of points which we can bring out from that into our discussion, and I'm sure we'll do so. So with that, and very sincere thanks to you and all your co-workers, let's turn to our next presentation, if we may. Okay, thank you, David. And hello, everyone. I'm Belle from the Jockey Club Center for Positive Aging. Um, today, I'm very happy to share with you our study on the impact of daycare service suspension in COVID-19 pandemic on dementia care. Okay. So um, Jockey Club Center for Positive Aging is the first comprehensive dementia service center in Hong Kong. And this year we are 20 years old. Um, we provide daycare and residential services to people with dementia. We organize um, capacity building workshops for formal and informed caregivers. We also do research on um, dementia care models. Currently we are conducting two trials, one on transitional care model and the other on post-diagnostic support. So in today's presentation, I will talk about um, the COVID-19 pandemic in Hong Kong and what we found out about the difficulties of caregivers and care recipients with dementia without the daycare service and what we could do for people with dementia and their caregivers in this pandemic. So in Hong Kong, we had our first case on the 23rd of January. And as of October, we have around 5,000 cases. Among them, 25% um, were older people. We had our first OH home case in early July. And as of October, we have um, 102 elderly in the OH homes infected with COVID-19. Uh, soon after our index case, the government announced uh, suspension of daycare service. Um, we could open for people in need. 
Our study was conducted in April and May, and at the period of time, the pandemic was rather stable, and the government announced gradual um, resumption of daycare services. But soon after the first OH home case, the government announce um, the suspension of daycare service again and around 20 days later very mass be, um, in public area became compulsory in hong kong and recently in late september the um, government an uh, announced the res gradual resumption of daycare services so our study aimed to investigate the caregiving challenges and caregiving stress of family caregivers of um, people with dementia and change of people with dementia um, during the pandemic without the, care, uh, without the uh, daycare uh, service. And we were very lucky to have in total 11 daycare centers to join our research. And the center staff was very kind to call the family caregivers for recruitment. Um, we had a trained researcher to do the telephone interview and the caregivers could also fill in the online questionnaire. Our questionnaire covers questions on caregiving difficulties, uh, caregiving stress. We also asked the caregivers about their observation on the change of people with dementia in terms of functioning abilities and incidents um, of accidents. We also asked um, the caregivers about their preference on daycare um, service usage. We have recruited more than 200 um, family caregivers and we successfully conducted 152 interviews. So the participants of our study were mainly female children of people with dementia. Um, the average age was 58 years old and over half of them didn't have paid jobs. The, most of um, the care recipients, the people with dementia, were female in moderate to late stage of dementia. Um, the average age was 82 years old, and most of them lived with the particip participant during the pandemic. We found that the participants of our study spent more time with the care recipients during the daycare service suspension, and over 80% of the care recipients went out less during the service suspension. The caregivers mainly worry about um, infection, either that they might get infected and then infect the care recipients, or the, recipient, uh, the care recipients might get infected when going out. So this partially explains why the care recipients went out less. Without daycare um, service and with such worry, the but caregivers just dare not leave, um, let the uh, care recipients go out. And without daycare services, the care recipients spent more time at home. So the caregivers also spent more time taking care of them. And as a result, they had less time for their own living. And they also have fun um, to adjust their own emotion and they got more physically tired. So most um, participants encounter greater caregiving stress during the daycare service suspension and the odds of increased caregiving stress were associated with an increase in caregiver's age um, because it's more difficult for older caregivers to seek resources such as face masks. And it's also more difficult for them to adjust to the change in lifestyle in the pandemic. The odds of increased um, caregiving stress were also associated with um, the deteriorated mood of care recipients. And most participants observed a deterioration in functional abilities of um, care recipients, in particular the condition and mobility. Um, without the daycare service, the care recipients had less social stimulation and their daily routine was disrupted. They may just spend their daytime watching TV or sleeping. And this might adversely affect their cognitive functioning. Also, they went or less, and they were not likely to have enough physical exercise at home. So their mobility would also be adversely affected by this social distancing measure. Um, close to 20% of our participants said that the care recipients um, had accidents or injuries 
such as fall um, or hospital admission or home accident during daycare service suspension. Well, among them, more than a half actually didn't have such accidents or injuries when they had daycare service. Close to 40% of our participants um, prefer to have daycare service during the uh, pandemic because they worried about uh, the deterioration of the care recipients. Um, also, daycare service was actually a main respite channel for them. For those who prefer suspension of um, the service, uh, again, infection was their main concern. When care recipients prefer to go outdoors, the caregivers tended to prefer continuation of daycare services because for them, daycare service might be a safer choice than other places for the care recipients if they had to go out. And when the care recipients were older, the caregivers tended to prefer suspension of service because um, maybe because of their worry about the infection with the perception that old people are more vulnerable to um, COVID-19 infection. So when there is no foreseeable end of pandemic, our center started to provide one-off um, training to both people with dementia and their caregivers. We also started a pilot on a 14 session online cognitive training for people with mild cognitive impairment and people in early stage of dementia. And in this intervention, the social worker delivered on cognitive training through Zoom and the clients, the participants and the social worker would do physical exercise together. And they also have time to discuss about the difficulties in life during the pandemic as peer support. So far, we got a very good attendance rate, and we found that people with mild cognitive impairment could basically handle the sessions all by themselves, while people with dementia may need some technical support from the caregivers. So in the future, we'll have more groups as a service, and we'll also start the trial to further investigate the effectiveness of this intervention. So um, the take home messages of, the, of my presentation are without daycare service, family caregivers of people with dementia experience greater caregiver stress because of longer caregiving time. Um, and people with dementia had, um, have deterioration in functional abilities. So we recommend daycare service for people with dementia to continue during the pandemic while the centers have to implement stringent infection control measures. And online cognitive training is feasible for people with, people with dementia, and it should be further developed so that people with dementia could have a good alternative to maintain their social stimulation in the era of pandemic and um, in the era of social distancing. Um, I would like to thank this organization and my colleague Toby for their help and support in this study. So this is the end of my presentation and this is my contact in case you have um, questions about our studies and you're very, uh, very welcome to um, visit our website. So um, thank you very much and I wish you all peace and health. Well, Belle, thank you very much indeed, and for your co-workers. That was an excellent presentation. I think once again, you've shown us the huge impact which the COVID-19 pandemic has had on sufferers, those receiving care, and on the carers themselves. And I think you've so clearly documented the impact of the closure of the day centres. Again, I think there are positive messages in there. You've shown how it was possible to continue giving support and indeed for the future, how cognitive support can be given and continue to be given. So thank you for all you've done on there and for sharing that with us. I think, again, we've got a number of key messages. I think what we'll want to do is to get some questions around what actually has happened, but more importantly, those key messages for the future, how we can build those. I think particularly for those parts of the world suffering now with the second wave, that's really important what we can learn from you. So let's then move on in our journey, if we may, and to our next presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jaita, and I'm an early career researcher for the Strengthening Responses to Dementia in Developing Countries Project, also known as STRIDE, at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in India. 
And today I'll be sharing with you a study we conducted here at NIMHANS exploring the experiences of family caregivers of persons with dementia during the COVID-19 pandemic here in India. So India currently has a population of 1.3 billion and almost 10% of that population comprises individuals aged 60 and above. And this is expected to rise to almost 19% by 2050. We have currently 5.29 million people living with dementia in the country. And these numbers are expected to almost triple by 2050. And despite the rising numbers of people with dementia in the country, only 10% of people with dementia receive any diagnosis, treatment, or care. And in the light of the limited evidence available on dementia and COVID-19, we were really keen to understand the impact of the pandemic on caregivers and people with dementia in the country. So at the time in which we collected data, which was between mid-May and June end, the COVID cases were rising considerably. At the start of our data collection period uh, in mid-May, we had around 80,000 COVID cases in the country. And by the end of our data collection period in June end, we had almost 470,000 COVID cases in the country. And at the time, the health ministry had done an age-wise analysis of the populations that were most affected. And they found that uh, elderly uh, contributed to almost 50.5% of all deaths and people with comorbidities contributed to almost 73% of all confirmed deaths. So multiple measures were taken to contain the pandemic. We had a nationwide lockdown that was announced on March 24th and went up till March 31st, I'm sorry, May 31st. And this was of course with phased relaxations. And um, it was only on June 1st, after almost two months in lockdown, that we entered the first phase of an unlock plan for the country. And um, considering that our data was collected during this period between May to June, uh, a lot of the responses that caregivers shared with us were in relation, with, uh, in relation to the uh, restrictions that were prevalent at the time. So the main objective of our study is to explore the experiences of family caregivers of persons with dementia during early phases of the pandemic in India. We were really keen to understand any challenges they experienced, especially in relation to care provision. And this is actually part of a larger mixed method study we conducted here at NIMANS, uh, consisting of patients with cognitive impairment and uh, their caregivers. And, but today I'll only be focusing on our qualitative methods and findings. So from 152 patients that we contacted for the mixed method study, 106 caregivers of patients with cognitive impairment participated in our qualitative interviews. And they were recruited via the Cognitive Disorders Clinic Registry at NIMHANS and ASHA Hospital in partnership with the Alzheimer's Related Disorder Society, Hyderabad. So the data collection took place in two cities. That was in Hyderabad and Bangalore. Both are in South India. And uh, we contacted participants via telephone. Uh, after receiving their verbal consent, we conducted the interviews. And the interviews were guided by a semi-structured interview guide, which covered a wide range of topics, including the challenges that they experienced, um, access to medical and social support services at the time, um, any uh, changes in routines that they were experiencing, as well as uh, what, were the, if, what are the effect of the changes on the caregivers and how they really adapted to this new scenario. And uh, the, our multilingual research team took detailed notes of participants' responses, and this was then analyzed thematically. So the majority of our caregivers fell under the middle socioeconomic bracket. This was almost 71%. Uh, and uh, they were predominantly providing care for patients with Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia. There were other diagnoses as well, such as dementia with Lewy bodies, Parkinson's disease dementia, and other non-dementia diagnoses, such as mild cognitive impairment. And these caregivers had been providing care for the duration of the patient's illness, which was almost three years. And from the 106 caregivers that we interviewed, 105 were primary caregivers who were predominantly spouses or children. And the majority of these caregivers, over half, were women. So after we conducted our thematic analysis, there were four major themes that emerged. 
The first was the unchanging reality of caregiving, the challenges experienced, the effect of changes on caregivers, and adapting to the change scenario. I'll be going into each one of these in the next few slides. So uh, uh, many caregivers spoke that they didn't really uh, feel that there was a change in their caregiving experiences during the time we collected data. So some caregivers expanded on this. So one caregiver said that from the time the diagnosis was made, I have forgotten that I have a life. I'm now running the house and also working. Similarly, another caregiver said he has been worsening day by day and doesn't remember anything. So these caregivers highlighted that they felt that their caregiving experience or their caregiving roles was associated with constant stressors, irrespective of the pandemic. And though the pandemic caused them to ch uh, make changes in certain aspects of their life, such as um, you know, restrict outdoor activities or adopt infection prevention measures, the major responsibilities that they had with respect to care provision remained unchanged. Caregivers then went on to talk about the challenges they experienced and the behaviors of patients were mentioned by few caregivers. So one caregiver mentioned that he is predominantly an outgoing person and suddenly asking him to stay in the house and not go outside was very difficult. He was irritated and would constantly fight to go outside. So uh, some of these changes in behaviors uh, which caregivers observed are likely to have been caused by the disruption in routines um, caused again by the pandemic induced lockdown. And this of course increased frustration among persons with dementia. And also this was quite difficult for caregivers to manage. So caregivers also spoke about difficulties in accessing medical and social care related services. So one caregiver mentioned that it has been difficult to go to a hospital with monthly checkups being stopped and general checkups being impossible in the current situation. Similarly, another caregiver spoke about difficulties in accessing long-term care support services such as daycare, because at that time they were suspended and they are still not running, but they were suspended. So uh, caregivers had to find new ways to engage their relative with dementia. And this was again, quite stressful. So as mentioned earlier, many caregivers felt that there was no real change in the pandemic with, related, with relation to their caregiving role. But for some caregivers, the pandemic aggravated an already difficult situation. So one caregiver mentioned that I feel a sense of isolation and a lack of support. And honestly, I think I'm out of words to even explain my situation. Similarly, another caregiver spoke about the lack of socialization at that time, really heightening feelings of loneliness and isolation. So despite the multiple difficulties that caregivers faced, uh, they still adapted a number of measures to, uh, uh, to kind of adjust to the new scenario. And first is the majority of caregivers adopted some form of infection prevention measures, wearing masks, hand washing, social distancing, though a few caregivers mentioned that this was really difficult to enforce on the person with dementia, as they couldn't really understand the need for such members, or need for such measures or remember the need for such measures. Caregivers also spoke about uh, changes in roles and responsibilities in their households during the lockdown period. So few caregivers mentioned that they were now able to spend more time with their relative on activities of daily living than prior to the lockdown. But they also mentioned difficulties in juggling their new work from home situation with their care provision responsibilities. Lastly, caregivers spoke about their plans for post lockdown. While the majority of caregivers said that they would continue to maintain infection prevention measures, there was a lot of eagerness to return back to outdoor activities, including daycare, um, socialization, going for walks, visiting temples, etc. So our, in conclusion, um, caring for persons with dementia is complex even during normal periods. And a public health emergency such as the COVID-19 pandemic has only aggravated the difficulties for some caregivers and also highlighted gaps in our health and social care system, which needs to be further addressed in order to improve our response to the pandemic, uh, improve our response to the pandemic and reduce the impact on vulnerable populations, as well as improve our responses to future such emergencies. So as majority of the dementia care is provided by families in their in, at their homes in the Indian context, there's an urgent need for more strategies and services to be developed that can support caregivers at their own homes in addition to care being provided at institutional settings. So a multidisciplinary approach involving 
um, social, medical, public health policy spheres is required to meet caregiver needs as well as um, reframe existing models of dementia care services in the country. Um, that's all from me. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I would like to thank Nimhans, uh, Asha Hospital, the Alzheimer's Related Disorder Society of India, and the Strengthening Responses to Dementia and Developing Countries Project, as well as I would like to thank all the caregivers who really took out the time to share their experiences with us. Thank you. Well, Jahisa, can I thank you very much indeed and your co-workers. Again, an excellent presentation for us. I think, once again, there are common themes here. I think you've shown very much the isolation which carers felt, uh, the very considerable increase in pressures on them, but equally that for some, they did have perhaps some more time to, to care uh, when during the lockdown. But I think the last message there about building the strategies to move forward is very important. So again, I think it's great that each of the presenters has brought out some take home messages and usually around three points which we can take forward in our panel discussion, and I'm sure we'll do so. So with that, let us move on then, if I may, to our next presentation. Thank you. So Agnes, would you like to start this for us? Um, yeah. Uh, Julia, I think, isn't it? Yes. Sorry, it's both of us. Both of us, right. <clears throat> Is Agnes there? Yes. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Yes, thank you. So thank you very much indeed for giving us the opportunity to present our work today. We are going to be talking about getting on with life in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, the development and evaluation of the online Go programme. And this is a collaboration between Durham University, University of Edinburgh and Innovations in Dementia. The project lead is, is Professor Charlotte Clark. My name is Julie Watson. I'm a research fellow at Edinburgh University and project manager. And I'll be presenting today with my colleague Agnes, who will introduce herself. Hi, everybody. My name is Agnes. 15 years ago, at the age of 57, I was diagnosed with dementia of the Alzheimer's type. Since then, I became a Knowledge Exchange Fellow of Edinburgh University and have been part of the GO project since the beginning. Thanks, Agnes. So just a, a brief overview of the talk today. I'll tell you a little bit about the project that we've been doing and then how we've had to pivot from face-to-face -face delivery to online delivery due to the COVID-19 restrictions and then just some of the learning that we have got so far from doing that. Agnes? We set out to, to develop and test in collaboration with people living with dementia a seven-week programme of post-diagnostic support. This programme was developed to help people currently not accessing support to live as well as they can with their dementia. And there was another strand to the project as well, which was is to try, is to try and understand how people move around the system post-diagnosis. And we're um, interviewing professionals as part of that, but we're not going to talk about that bit today. So what we did in the first phase, which was last year from February 2019 till October 2019, is that we ran nine workshops with people living with dementia. 23 of them had a diagnosis and then we had 13 care partners. And we also did 11 telephone interviews with people working with people with dementia. And what we found in that first phase, what people were telling us as we were asking them, how, to, how do we develop a programme um, what should be in it. One of the, the important things that came out of that was the importance of the underpinning principles and values in the approach to the facilitation. So some vital ingredients there, which Agnes will speak about. Yes, our core yes. program principles, which we developed, was to that everyone who comes to our um, programme already brings things and knows things and they can learn things and teach things. So it's learning together, doing things with each other rather than for or to each other. Our personalized goals, 
led by the needs of the participants rather than an imposed agenda. We also had values which we developed, which was to provide a safe space, a good welcome, have fun, but you need to be serious about some things too. Some people might come along on the day and be sad or angry and grieving for the things that they've lost and they need to be able to express this or not if they wish. Let's be flexible here. Everyone helps each other. We also wanted to provide a respectful space. So please don't treat people like children. Don't talk over the people. You've got dementia, but you've got a life to live. Friendliness and being accepted as you are are the most important things. So no judgment. Sessions need to run in a way that enables everyone to contribute verbally and other ways appropriate to individual abilities. Give us time to talk and ask questions. And so in this first phase of, of consultation with people living with dementia, we came up with um, a seven week programme. And these are some of the overarching themes that we cover each week. So like we just said, the first week, it's really important to create that welcome and safe space for people to feel comfortable um, and feel that they can um, be supported to take part as well as they can. Week two is understanding my dementia experience. So encouraging people to come with their questions, the experiences that they are having, rather than us saying, these are the these are all the symptoms you're going to have and this is what it's going to be like. It's, it's very much led by the people um, who are coming and shaped by their needs. And then week three is about confidence to live well with dementia. Confidence was a, a big issue that came up a lot that people, when they get a diagnosis of dementia, they lose confidence. And so building confidence is a, is a big part of this programme and helping people to live, hopefully, then looking at our needs and our rights, many people with dementia don't know what their rights are in relation to living with dementia on all kinds of topics. And then staying connected. One of the things that came out of the first phase was that one of the biggest challenges is that um, people start to get treated differently as soon as they get a diagnosis of dementia, the families and friends maybe withdraw. Um, so staying connected is about looking at how do, you, how do you maintain and you know make new friendships as well. And then week six is getting on and living your life. And that um, I've put down at the bottom here, a plan for week eight. This was something that came out of the first phase as well, is that it's all very well having a seven week programme, but what happens on the week that it finishes? In other words, week eight when the, the program's not running. So a big part of this um, program is looking at how do we connect people into other things once the program finishes. And then week seven is celebrating achievements and very much um, looking at all the things, all the strategies that and the hints and the tips that people have learned from each other in that peer support and celebrating that as a way again of building confidence. So and then so phase that was phase one and then phase two the plan was that started in November 2019 and was to run until December this year and our aim was to test and further develop the programme face to face in four regions in the northeast of England and we had ethical approval to do that and we were about to start recruiting back in March when of course as we all know um COVID arrived and everything was shut down and we weren't allowed to do anything face to face. So the research was halted um, for a few months, but um, we realised actually there was a real opportunity here. And I think from what the other speakers have been saying, we can see the real impact that uh, not only COVID itself has had on people with dementia and their families, but if the effect of lockdown and the effect of isolation is very detrimental. So we realised that there was an opportunity here to look at how can we continue to deliver this programme, but not face to face. 
So thankfully, the Alzheimer's Society who are funding this project gave us a no cost extension. And so now we're up and running again. Yes, but to be up and running, this meant that we needed to develop different skills and use different techniques, some digital and others the old fashioned way. So we started to use Zoom and also we found that not all of the participants were able to or comfortable using digital. So we went back to the old fashioned method of using postal and also making phone calls. This was always participant needs led. It was up to the participants to say what they wanted and the team went out their way to provide the needs. Yeah, so we developed a, a, a new facilitator's manual, <clears throat> very much still adhering to those original principles and values that Agnes has spoken about. And we developed weekly materials. We realized it was important, even when people were able to meet online, um, that it was still important to have something materially to hold on to. So we developed materials that get sent out for each week with some things for people to think about and then feed into to help them to prepare for the Zoom call. And we also sent everyone a mug because we, we, that sense of togetherness and being in community was really important as well for us. So everyone got a mug that they drink from when they're on the Zoom call. And so, so far, um, where we're at is that we have run the programme once in one area and we are on week three in the second area and it's going to run twice more in the new year in other areas. And so the new learning that we've had so far, um, the time there is a real time investment needed in preparing people to join on week one. Part of that is around technology and making sure people have the right support to use technology, but also helping people to work out how they can contribute to the best of their ability, especially if they have issues like word finding um, issues, and also just to build trust and rapport with the facilitator. And weekly summary letters have also been a really important part of that and phone calls in between the Zoom call meeting. And Agnes, do you want to just say about this last point? Yes, um, we found that inviting speakers who were already living, people living with dementia, to contribute their lived experience worked extremely well and it was reported back that they, they like to hear that and to meet others with a diagnosis. So and other learning is that the focus on relationships issues was a very significant week for the participants in the first round um, and we think that maybe that should come earlier than week five and at you know, we have to say that it doesn't work for everyone. One lady in the first round did pull out because she found it, she was just too anxious being on Zoom. Um, but we've learned from that in the second round. She was a lady who had word finding difficulties. And we're, we have learned from that in terms of how we support people to, to be on the call um, w w when they have that challenge. Yes, um, it's only light. Right, I feel a we as a team felt to leave the last word to a person living with dementia. This gentleman, he said, the whole program was informative and made me feel at ease. It put my mind at rest that, that although this is a disease that is disabling, it is not something that is going to kill you immediately. It's a case of trying to live with it and embrace it. Every week I have gained more confidence. So I would like on behalf of Julie and I to thank you all for listening to us and thank you all for your presentation. Thank you very much. Well, Julie and Agnes, can we thank you very much indeed for sharing that uh, presentation with us and your experience. I think that really, that quote at the end, that testimony, says it all. I think you obviously entered the pandemic in a good phase because you were already planning 
for this. And I think that must have helped take things forward. I also noted the small but very important things you've done. I think you referred to having a mug available for people and also the importance of the telephone call. It's not all just about the iPad and the PC. The telephone call is also very important. So thank you very much indeed for that. So let us now come to our final presentation. I'm going to call on Emily to give that to us. Uh, and you are, you may be last, but by no means least. So really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone. Um, so my name's Emily and it's lovely to be here. And thank you for the opportunity to present highlights from our review study, which sought to understand the early impacts of COVID on care home residents living with dementia. Um, as we know, care homes are obviously important providers. Oh, sorry, Emily, uh, your slides are not on the screen at the moment. Ah, OK. Sorry, yeah. I'll uh, No worries, I'll no worries. Hello everyone, um, my name's Emily and it's lovely to be here and thank you for the opportunity to present highlights from our review study which sought to understand the early impacts of COVID on care home residents living with dementia. Um, care homes are obviously important providers of dementia care, where a significant proportion of residents may have some form of dementia. Uh, so here's our research team um, that undertook the review. Uh, so there's uh, myself, I'm a research fellow based at De Montfort University in Leicester. Um, there's Professor Kay De Vries, a professor of older people's health, also based at De Montfort, and um, Dr Karen Harrison-Denning, um, who has a role at De Montfort and is also um, head of research and publications at Dementia UK. So we had two main research aims in this review. Um, firstly, to understand the early and initial impacts of COVID on care home residents with dementia in real time as the pandemic was unfolding and to analyse how these impacts were communicated to the public. So this included the experience of residents who sadly caught COVID as well as those who were impacted as a result of COVID. So for example, through wider system pressures or um, challenges with availability of healthcare. So as I've said, this review aimed to understand the initial impacts of COVID in real time as events were unfolding. Um, and this is what we now understand as, as the first wave or the first peak of the pandemic. So most of the information about early impacts on care home residents um, with dementia was available in um, the media and um, grey sources of information. Um, so as a result, it was necessary to appraise um, that literature that was being published in the moment within particular time parameters, um, particularly looking at, at journalist sources. So that required us to take quite a um, novel um, methodological approach with the research, um, which was qualitative media analysis and tracking discourse. Um, so qualitative media analysis seeks to identify meanings and patterns within media content through themes, frames and stories. So themes can be classified within media content to understand salient issues within news articles. Um, identifying journalistic frames helps to demonstrate how the same topics might be discussed or positioned in different ways at different times within the media. And tracking discourse uses coding to monitor changes in media coverage and its emphasis over time. So combined, this approach of identifying themes, frames and tracking helps us to understand 
the overarching story that is being told as it unfolds. So to do this, we developed search terms and conducted database searches, for example, through Lit COVID, which was an academic resource that emerged at the time, collecting together uh, journal articles being published around um, COVID. And we also did search engine searches um, through uh, different um, online platforms to identify news articles. Um, and we undertook these searches at three distinct time points during the first peak of the pandemic, um, which was between April and June. So after screening um, hundreds of articles, we included 47 in the review, which were a combination of media and academic sources, largely from the UK and Europe, um, but also some from North America, China and New Zealand. Um, we then coded the articles and identified the themes, which were then tracked over the three distinct time points. Um, we then synthesized these themes to understand the overarching story that was being told to the public about the impacts um, on care home residents uh, with dementia during the pandemic. So we identified 18 themes in our analysis um, the impacts on people with dementia of COVID in care homes included themes as diverse as safety, staff avail availability and ethical care. Um, I'll just talk about a few of these um, issues today, given the time available, um, but specifically themes relating to loneliness, isolation and social distancing. So as I'm sure we're now sadly all too familiar with, um, there were some really heartbreaking um, examples during the first pandemic peak of people with dementia alone at the end of life in care homes. Many family visits were suspended to enable social distancing and certain group care home activities um, were, were stopped. And these changes led to uh, experiences of um, loneliness and, and isolation. And it was a real challenge for staff to balance meeting the psychosocial needs of uh, residents with dementia in care homes with the need for virus safety, uh, particularly in the absence of government guidelines in, in the case of the UK. There were also some particular challenges to maintaining social distancing for people with dementia um, due to wandering um, and also memory problems meant that some residents forgot it was necessary to self-isolate or were understandably distressed by the sight of uh, personal protective equipment or PPE. However, um, the analysis of the articles also showed that these unprecedented circumstances led to some innovations in care delivery and certainly some incredible sacrifices from, from care staff. Um, in one example, uh, care staff moved into a care home during lockdown, leaving their own families in order to protect residents um, and offer round the clock care. And this obviously helped to reduce the impact of, of loneliness and isolation significantly in, in that case. In some instances, a residents were able to use video technologies for the first time to communicate with loved ones while in the care home and telephone support was offered from other health and care professionals to improve multidisciplinary working. Of course, as the pandemic continues, um, there will be further impacts that may be felt um, in, in care homes. Um, so in terms of the overall story from the data, 
the analysis from each of the three time points showed a rapidly changing narrative was communicated to members of the public regarding the impact of COVID on care home residents with dementia. Again, this was during the so-called first wave of the pandemic. So the data analysis showed that the story was told using three distinct frames. Frame one focused on the dominance of hospital care. So during this time, data reporting deaths and admissions only related to hospitals or primarily related to hospitals within the um, selection of, of media articles that we analysed. So the media was reporting pressure on hospital admissions and in particular intensive care units. And in the UK, there was a prime focus on protecting the National Health Service, the NHS and the delivery of health care, whereas social care and care homes were hardly mentioned. About a month later, the picture in the media had changed um, and frame two shows us that there was a real focus now on the plight of care homes. So by now, there was widespread recognition that care homes had been overlooked and ignored. Um, the lack of uh, testing and PPE shortages in care homes came to light and a collaboration of leaders from third sector organisations in the UK, including the Alzheimer's Society, wrote an open letter to the Secretary of State for Health to highlight the devastating effects of COVID on care home residents, particularly those living with dementia. So the spotlight was now firmly on care homes and by the third month of our media analysis, frame three showed that the focus was on the emerging death rate uh, in care homes. So the media was now widely publicising um, the tragedy of um, loss of life in care homes during the pandemic, which coincided with the release of data from the Office of National Statistics in the UK. Some media articles by this stage were also producing analysis on how and why this tragedy could have occurred. It was also clear that decision makers such as government officials um, were to be held accountable for their handling of the pandemic so far within the media. And there were calls for a public inquiry into the death rate in care homes in the UK. So by way of a conclusion, um, it's clear that the pandemic has had a significant impact on care home residents living with dementia, impacts that we still don't know the full extent of, um, and certainly being aware of these initial early impacts will hopefully help us all um, as we plan um, responses to future and current um, peaks of, uh, of coronavirus in the future. Um, it's clear that the story in the media um, and also in, in academic articles um, has, has changed over time and that that media narrative is, is still changing as events unfold. Um, and I think it's also really important to state that um, care homes are, are to be commended for um, how they've dealt with these unprecedented circumstances. Um, they've, they've dealt admirably with the crisis, with limited resources and lack of um, clear guidance and um, care staff uh, have, have been outstanding. Um, so that's everything from me. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, then uh, you can find my contact details there. Thank you very much.
So, Emily, thank you very much indeed for your presentation there. And again, for drawing out some very important key themes, which we'll take forward. So that concludes our really excellent presentations and sharings today. We've quite literally gone around the world, and that's wonderful, as this is a global pandemic. So what we're now going to do is to move into our Q&A session, particularly focusing on those learnings which have been brought out, uh, sharing those and bringing, I'm sure, a lot of questions about what's happened during the pandemic, but I'm equally sure people will want to ask questions about how those learnings, learnings for those of us in the second wave, and as we still face the difficulties and lockdowns in many parts of the world, but also those learnings, which I think will perhaps carry forward when the pandemic is behind us, with the good news now about the vaccine coming forward, but what learnings can we take forward which will improve the for sufferers, for patients, but also for carers as we move forward. So thank you all again very much for that. I'm sure now we're going to have a very rich question and answer session and comments. Thank you.